pastors uh, here at New Life Press, and it's uh, a joy to see you all. And uh, before I read the passage, just a reminder that August at New Life Press, if you're visiting, is what we call um, our preparation month, or we call it a ministry break, but it's actually one of the busiest seasons of our church because the leaders and staff are prepping for our ministry year, which kicks off in September. So that means that we're praying, we're planning, we ask for your prayers and for your encouragement for us as well as we move forward pursuing our vision. And it also means that every Sunday in August is all church worship, which is wonderful because one of our goals and hearts is to have all the children worship with their parents on Sunday service. And New Life Kids is not meant to necessarily replace the parental role, but really to assist the parental role. And so we worship together. Kids are rowdy. They have a hard time paying attention. We love that. Their cries are our cries. So parents feel free to be a family and to lead your children in that way. And with that said, if I could ask you to please stand, let's uh, read the Word of God together. I'm going to read from Psalm 113. It's a short but succinct and sweet psalm, Psalm 113, nine verses. This is God's Word. I pray that you will be blessed here today. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory among the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives them, he gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. You can take your seats at this time. Well, one of the questions during the past couple of years, during the lockdown and the pandemic and the challenges of navigating the complexities of COVID, one of the questions I often got from various circles of pastor friends is, what is your church going to do? And that was a tough question, sort of the blind leading the blind, but I always said consistently, when you look at the Bible, No matter COVID and lockdown and pandemic, no matter if we're back to quote-unquote normal, what the church ought to do is going to be a focus on the basics. The basics. And one of the basics of the church and your responsibility and mine is to worship. And that's why most of the Psalms that we consider in some form or fashion deal with the idea of worship. And Psalm 113 is exactly about that. It's about worship, and so we should never be tired of hearing the same command over and over because those churches that do the basics well tend to be the most fruitful because it's the most biblical and God-honoring. And so we're going to consider worship here today, and there's two simple points broken out really nicely in this passage. So we're going to look at two points about worship. First, that we are called to worship, and then secondly, the reasons for worship. In other words, two points, there's a command to worship, and then secondly, there are reasons to worship God. So that's what we'll look at, that we should worship, why we should worship. So let's look at this together, that we should worship, and we're going to break this down. If you look at the verses, I'm essentially going to look at verses 1 to 3, that we should worship. There's a command there. Let me read 1 through 3 again for us. It says, praise the Lord. There's your command. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Now, we know that this psalm is about praise and worship because the first verse and the last verse end on the same commandment. Praise the Lord. It sort of is a sandwich which tells us all the verses in the middle are really explaining to you how do you praise the Lord? Why is it important? What does that really mean? As C.S. Lewis once said about the book of Psalms, Lewis said this, The most valuable thing the Psalms do for me is to express the same delight in God which made David dance. And that's what the Psalms does. It captures the human experience. It has a big view of God, but also an honest, realistic picture of life. And this vision of worship is given to us in verses 2 to 3. If you read that again really quickly, verse 2 says, let's praise God from this time forevermore. In other words, it's talking about praising God in eternity because God is eternal. We'll always live with him if you believed and embraced Jesus Christ as yourself. 
from this time forth forevermore. Can you imagine that? Eternity, worshiping God with our songs, with our voices, our bodies together, this glamorous and miraculous and profound kingdom picture of the entire earth worshiping God forever, in eternity. The idea of time never ending is what captures the essence of this verse. We're going to worship him forever. Now, this isn't the most eloquent illustration to capture that point, but this past week, one of the staff members in the women's bathroom caught 47 cockroaches. <laughs> Don't worry, we cleaned it up. The deacons and us, we do a great job. Everything's sanitary. We pass code every year. But when the heat comes out, the cockroaches come in and they caught 47. I don't know why they counted it, but they counted 47 cockroaches. And at lunch, they're talking about that no matter what you do, cockroaches are always around. No matter how many times that you spray sort of insecticide or whatnot, close up the drainage, they're always around. You're always battling this. This is true of every building, every house. And it reminded me once of what my professor at seminary once told me, Dr. Vern Poitras. And at one point in class, he was talking about, believe it or not, cockroaches. And he says, I don't know why God actually created cockroaches. Cockroaches are probably here before the dinosaurs. And if man ever becomes extinct, cockroaches will be on the earth, roaming alive after man leaves the earth. And he says, I don't know why God created cockroaches, but I think it's because God created cockroaches to tell you and me that God is eternal. <laughs> They're always going to be around. We are going to worship God from this time forth forevermore. And then secondly, in verse 3, this vision of worship also says from the rising to the setting of the sun. And when I first read this, I was thinking, wait, we're supposed to worship God just in the daylight from the rising of the sun to the setting and that just shows more of a Western individualistic perspective that we're more clock-oriented. You now, we think about our lives around the clock and productivity, but what it's talking about is not chronology or time, it's talking about space. From as far as the, set, the sun rises to as far as the sun sets. In other words, the entire span of the earth and universe in all eternity is going to praise the Lord. And that's what he commands you and I to do. See, it's interesting because when you look specifically at this command, one of the things that the psalmist does for us is that he addresses the identity of people. And he calls them servants. Now, he didn't say soldiers. He doesn't say missionaries, disciples. But he says servants. Servants praise the Lord. Why do you think that is? Well, if you dig down into it, that word servant can also be translated as slave. Slaves you better praise the name of the Lord. And that's really shocking because in the context of Psalm 113, it's talking about the Exodus event. And Exodus, if you didn't realize this in the Old Testament, is about the Israelites being freed from the evils and the atrocities and the oppression of slavery. And so God frees them through Moses and then brings them into a relationship with him. And the first thing that he says in some level is to say, slaves, you better worship me. And it's shocking because you're thinking they should be free, but you realize he says servants, he says slaves, because on a human level, we are always serving someone. We are always captivated in our hearts by something. It's triggering to call them slaves again, but it's getting the point across that in humanity, everyone is a slave, everyone is a master, has a master, everyone worships. That's the point. We are all really good worshipers, but he's saying, you better worship the one and true God. Maybe I can make this point to say that everyone has a master, because I don't know, if you're in a family, maybe yourself, you have some siblings, maybe you're a parent, maybe your parents have siblings, but there's always what we call sibling rivalry, and it may look different to different families. You may pick on the youngest one. I'm the youngest in my family. I felt like I got picked on by my older brother a lot. And I felt I had to live up to his reputation. You know, the family dynamics is different. Maybe your sibling is a little bit more gifted, a little bit more athletic, a little bit more likable and savvy, and maybe you just feel you're just different. Maybe you feel like the typical quote-unquote middle child. You know, what is the, the rivalry? What is that sort of feeling that you have in the family? Now, why do I bring this up? Because no matter what your family is like, can you ever imagine that your older brother was Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Because that's James, who's the half-brother of Jesus. 
And he writes this letter, James does, and his older brother is the savior of the universe. They probably grew up in the same home, ate at the same dinner table, eaten the same kind of food, maybe slept in the same bed. And can you imagine the sort of angst or whatever experience that James must have experienced and gone through to know that across the dinner table is a guy who's 100% God, taken on human flesh, called to die for the world and be the savior, perfect life, perfect teacher. He's perfect in every way. You ever have a sibling that you think, mom and dad always love them, he's always or she's always very perfect. In Jesus' case, in James's experience, that's absolutely true. And do you know how James, when he writes his letter, identifies himself? James, a slave of God and of Jesus Christ. Even James identifies himself as a slave. So when the psalmist comes in and he says, servants praise the Lord, it's trying to convey the fact to you and me that everyone has a master, everyone is a slave. It tells you and I, even if you're not a Christian, you always worship someone. That's what Bob Dylan once said in this song, you got to serve somebody. Bob Dylan was a born-again Christian when he wrote this song. I think it, it won some sort of award. And some of the lyrics, I'm just going to read this. It's not going to be projected. But he's talking about even him, that everyone worships. And in his song, you got to serve somebody. He says, you may be an ambassador to England or to France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. You're going to have to serve someone in this world. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Do you know why? Because Bob Dylan is absolutely true and correct. Worship is not a religious activity. Worship is a human activity. What does it mean to worship? Well, this one pastor in Atlanta, Louis Giglio, I think he captures it very well. Worship is about value. The simplest definition Giglio writes or says is that worship is our response to what we value the most. That is why worship is something we all do, Christian or not. Worship is about saying this person, this thing, this degree, this pleasure, I value as the highest, most important reality in my life. And every one of you has that. It could be money, it could be approval, it could be some version of pleasure, it could be comfort, but every one of you, you got to serve somebody. And that's why the psalmist is absolutely true, it says servants, because all of you are going to be servants of something or someone, but at the end of the day, the psalmist is saying, if you're bought by the blood of Jesus, you should serve, you should worship, you are a slave to righteousness, and the object of your worship, the supreme joy and value of your heart is going to be, or should be, God. In other words, friends, everyone has an altar. Everyone has a throne. Everyone has a trail that you follow, and at the end of the trail, you'll see and discover your treasure. And you're thinking, well, what is that for me? And this is just a couple of hints, a couple of thoughts to discover your altar, your throne. The end of the trail is sort of, you know, this is an older analogy. It's basically follow the rainbow, and then you'll find the pot of gold or the leprechaun. Follow the rainbows of your life. How do you do this? How do you discover the altar and throne if it's not Jesus? Very simple. You want to follow the trail? You want to discover the altar? You want to go to the end of the rainbow and find the pot of gold for you, metaphorically? Follow your money. Follow your time. Follow your natural thoughts and energy. Very simply, if you're an accountant, audit your money, your time, your thoughts, and your words. If you follow those three things, you'll have a very clear picture of your altar and throne. Potentially. Everyone's got to serve somebody. But our, our job, our calling... My role as a pastor, very simply put, is at the end of the day, with your family, with your energy, with your time, with your money, with your thoughts, with your words, that when you follow the trail and go to the end of the rainbow, it's not like the Wizard of Oz, but you follow the end of the rainbow, you know what you find? Our job is to make sure that when you discover the altar is Jesus Christ on the throne. That's what we're all about. Worship and praise the Lord. 
with all that you got and all that you have, with all that you value, every breath that you have, every part of your soul, your affection, your attention, your allegiance, your proclamation, every step of your life as you walk in this world should reflect that I'm following the path because at the end of the rainbow for me, I worship Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. That's what he tells us. That's the command. But here's the second point. He gives us the reasons why we should worship. Very simply put, the reasons he gives for worship are in verses 4 to 9. But let me break this up for us a little bit because it's a wonderful picture. There's almost this contrast. 4 to 9 gives you these reasons, says this is who God is, this is what he's done. But it's such a wonderful and heartfelt picture of the reasons that we are given to worship God. Because in verses 4 to 6, what we see about God is that he's really big. It's the gospel big. He's sovereign. He's exalted. He's high above all the nations. You get a sense of how transcendent he is, how above us he is. He's high above the heavens. He's seated on high. He looks far down, not just down, but far down to what? To heaven. How high do you have to be to say, I'm looking far down to heaven and to the earth? Further than the man on the moon. He's looking far down to the universe. He's so high that he has to look down. It's a picture of the gospel big. Now that's encouraging for us because one of the reasons we could worship God is because he's bigger than your problems. It's in good hands. He's bigger than the world and all the political polarization and division and atrocity and oppression and death and injustice. And we should care about that, but it shows us that God is so sovereign and exalted. He's like, I got this. Don't worry about it. I got it. I'm a pretty big God. I'm powerful. I'm exalted. He's not saying it in a cocky way. He's saying it in a godlike way. So he's really big in verses 4 to 6, but this is what I want to spend some time on. This God who is huge, he's ginormous in verses 4 to 6. He's also in verses 7 to 9. He's really small. He's about the gospel intimate. He's about the gospel small. You know, this God who is high above, transcendent, looks far down to heaven, gets down really low into the details of your lives, not because he's a type A, type a micromanager, but because he loves you that much. He's empathetic towards you that much. He craves a fellowship and a transformation in your life that much. The God who's really big cares about the really small. The God who's really high comes down to be the God who's really low. So let's look at this. Let's look at the gospel small. Verse 7 says this, part of it. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. This is probably the most vivid metaphor of people who are poor, the poorest of the poor. Now, even in that second clause, lifts the needy from the ash heap. Ash heap, that Hebrew word also could be understood as toilet because it's the dunghill. It's excrement. You know, it's rubbish, it's garbage. And they say when you read about the city of Jerusalem or any city, that outside of the city gates of Jerusalem are really the trash heap, the rubbish, the garbage, the garbage can. It's the dung hill. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, I see the poorest of the poor. You're down and out, you're in the dung hill, you're in the garbage. And God, from this high view, comes down small, cares about the individual realities and struggles of your life, It lifts you out of the ash heap and the rubbish. And what does it say? Makes you a prince. He comes, in other words, friends, to those who are down in the dumps, changes and transforms you, and gives you the status and the glorious picture and privileges of being a prince. That's what he does for you. See, friends, some of you, metaphorically, experientially, existentially, Maybe feeling like you are in the dumps of your life. Maybe your marriage is tough. Maybe your kids are struggling. Children, it's tough being you. Middle school, elementary, high school, there's a lot of pressure. Mom and dad don't understand. There's no way Pastor Will's going to understand. No one gets me. You have no friends, you're lonely, you get bullied. There's all kinds of reasons and experiences for all ages. 
and you literally feel like you're in the dumps. You feel disconnected from life. You feel like a hollow man of a person. And what this tells us here is that God sees you exactly where you are. As far and high as he is, he comes down and he digs himself into your life. And he takes your experiences and your pain upon himself and his son, Jesus Christ. And he says, I get it. I'm here for you. I'm not just far and distant like a CEO. I'm someone who will come down to the level of your suffering and pain and hurt. I'll come down literally into the trash, into the dunghill, into the rubbish, into the ashes of your life. And I'm going to dwell with you. I'm going to sit down with you into the ashes of your life. I once heard this story in worship at a PCA church. Not sure how big it was, but there was a homeless man that walked into the service in the middle of Sunday, looked around, everyone was upper middle class, wearing nice suits and their Sunday best, didn't know where to sit. So this homeless man sat right in the front in the middle of the aisle. He didn't know where else to go. He felt like he was lower. One of the elders got up and took off his jacket then took off his tie and took off his button-down shirt and just wore a white T-shirt, sat down right next to this homeless man, not thinking that he was better, but just because he was human, put his arm around him, and they worshiped God together by the throne. God comes down to that level. God gravitates towards the marginalized. God gravitates toward those who are poor. Our culture, especially even in the church, that's all captured by this Western idea of success and glory and money, the celebrity culture, and even myself, we tend to gravitate in our hearts towards the powerful, towards the famous, towards the big. But if you capture the gospel, what we recognize is that the one who moves to the marginalized, to the lonely, to the hurting, to the person who has no friends, that's the person that's in the movement and runs in the rhythm and the rhyme of God's heartbeat. In other words, let me put it this way. The person who understands and has been taken aback and been enraptured by this big vision of God, the one person, the way that you can tell that someone has been taken aback by this big vision of God, is because they move towards those who are in the ashes. Does that make sense? Those Christians who usually just stay in the upper echelons of elite society, hobnobbing with those who are famous and hobnobbing with those in power, and that's just all they want, but never move down. Those are the pictures of people that never understood how big and glorious God is because if you capture the bigness and the gospel big of God, it'll compel you by a spirit to live out and apply the gospel small in the daily intimate realities of your life. I think that's what God is trying to show us. And then secondly, it says here in verse 9, it's not just those who are in the dumps, but he also talks about women. He gives a barren woman a home making her, cho- her the joyous mother of children. Now, I was talking about barren women, those who have basically fertility issues. And the one thing we can say is that it's not promising as much pain, as much heartache that some of the sisters of this church or in this world who have a hard time getting pregnant. It's not saying that if you believe in Jesus, he guarantees you'll have a child. It's more the principle. One is saying, I empathize with women who are barren. And in Jesus, even though spiritual, there is a hope to have a reversal of fortune. This is why it's so important. We could probably relate to this. Maybe the sisters can. You could come and speak to me after this. I'm just trying my best as a male to understand this. But in the ancient Near Eastern context, back in the days of the Old Testament, a woman's identity and a woman's value was absolutely and inextricably tied up to her ability to have children. And there's some practical sense. The more children you have, then if you have a business, the more workers you have. You know, you have free labor. You know, more chores around the house. But it was bound up in that. It wasn't just even children, but a woman's identity was bound up with her ability to produce sons. That's why in the patriarchal society, in which it was a chauvinistic culture, one that we don't embrace, but the gospel speaks into this, by the way, is saying women who are able to produce a lot of sons were esteemed as more valuable in that culture and society and eyes. But that means women who were barren, they had no status, no way to produce for themselves, no identity, no community. And that's why verse 9 says, I see women. I see those who are like this. And he says, it's not right. And he gives the barren woman a home because the barren woman is usually by herself. 
and I'll give her to be a joyous mother of children, saying that there will be a reversal of fortunes. There will be, at one point, hope. Because a woman in that culture who wasn't able to produce children had no hope for herself and for her life. And is saying that God, who is really big, will come down to your level and give you hope, give you a dream that could be a, a reality. And what's so beautiful about verse 9 is this. It's actually quoting a song. It's actually a song. It's chasing a song from 1 Samuel to Psalm 1 and 13 to Luke chapter 1, in which the Mary, the mother of Jesus, sings what they call the Magnificat. It's tracing this song, this whole theme in which there's poor, there's hurting, there's marginalized, there's women who can't have a baby. And it's tracing this idea that the God of Old and New Testament always cares about that. The hurting, the marginalized, he sees the details of your lives. And he quotes from Hannah, her song, her poem in 1 Samuel 2. Hannah was barren, but eventually God blessed her and was able to give her the son of Samuel, who was a leader and pointed towards Jesus Christ. But then we come and fast forward to Luke chapter 1, and there's another quote with the same idea as the song from Hannah, quoted in Psalm 113, said and sung again by Mary in the same spirit in Luke chapter 1. And it's the same sort of theme because Mary had a lot of empathy for her cousin Elizabeth, who was barren but then gave birth to John the Baptist. And I think the Bible is playing on this. It's saying, well, Hannah, she was barren, but God blessed her and gave birth to Samuel. The Samuel can't be the savior of the world. Psalm 113 is alluding to this and says, I'm going to reverse the fortunes. I'm going to make the barren woman a home, and I'm going to give her to be the mother of children. And it points towards the same idea when Mary comes onto the scene, sings this song called the Magnificat, because not only does she empathize with her cousin Elizabeth, Mary herself was probably young in age, never had intimate relationships with her husband, but God blesses her with the greatest, most miraculous birth called Jesus Christ. And he blesses her. And in his son, Jesus Christ, he blesses you and me. And in Jesus, it shows us this trajectory of a God who is high, comes down to the depths of the low, not even to our human suffering, but further down for believers like you and me into the depths of hell, and then was raised up again. And so when we see this psalm that says God is transcending, there's a gospel big, and now there's a gospel small that comes into the ashes of our lives, is saying the reason we know that God understands this is because with crystal clarity, he shows you and me, I send Jesus Christ. He was really big. He was a prince of princes. He was a lord of lords. And he came down in this world, took on human flesh, to the point in which he died upon the cross for you and me. In other words, he went into the ash heaps of your life. He went and experienced the barrenness of your life in order to give you a home, in order to give you hope, in order to give you and to make you a prince or princess in his kingdom. I think that's what Paul's talking about in Philippians chapter 2. In 2, 5 through 9, this is what Paul writes about Jesus Christ. One of the most beautiful poems that we see, talking about Jesus, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The same mind, the same thinking. Who though, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Who did the psalmist address? Servants, praise the name. He took the form of a servant, a slave, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. The Prince of Princes, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, who is up there, he saw the world from far above, but he came down to the depths of our suffering and went further down into the basement of our hells to lift us back up. He went into your dunghill. He went into your toilet. He went into your garbage can. He went into the ashes of your life, the experiences of your brokenness, to lift you up out of your messiness and the dunghill of your sin and make you a prince and a princess in his kingdom. He did that for you. Yeah, we haven't fully experienced it yet, but just wait a moment. You get a taste of it now. You're going to experience that the day that Jesus comes back. And he's going to lift you up and he's going to exalt you as we continue to exalt him in this world. Jesus, the prince of the world, went to the ash heap to make you and me the ash heap of our sins, prince and princesses of this world. 
He looked at the barrenness. He says, you have no identity. You have no home. You had a lostness. You have no hope until this transcendent God who's big came down in his son, made him small in the intimacy and the details of your life. And he did this because he loves you. He cares for you. He transforms you. He understands you. He sees you. And he makes you his own. If there's any reason to worship God, because you've got to serve somebody, I'm going to challenge you. Come up with better reasons than this. Because who is like our God? No one is. Let's turn to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word and your son. We thank you that you are so big that we could find comfort and security and hope. But yet you care about the details of our lives. You are humble. You are imminent. You are empathetic and loving. You identify with us in every way, in ways that we can't even imagine. So we thank you, Lord, that you see us and you do something about it. Help to cultivate within our church and our hearts that gospel mentality, having that mind of Jesus Christ in ourselves by his spirit, that we can live in that same rhythm and flow, that rhyme and reason that Jesus has shown us in the gospel and the cross of Jesus. We thank you so much, God, and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.